This week's Q&A video. Uh, I'm filming this on a really gloomy Sunday and I'll put it online uh, tomorrow. It's uh, really raining and stormy outside. Uh, yesterday we played with Trappe in, in, uh, in The Hague and uh, if you came to the concert then uh, thank you for dropping by. It's great to see so many people there uh, and I also got a chance to talk to a few of you guys so that's nice. Um, in this Q&A video I'm gonna talk about uh, my amp and my setup and how I work with uh, modeling amps because that's what I'm using. I'm going to talk about Evo skills, about the kind of pick I use and why, and why I'm not using a thinner pick, essentially, and also about clashing chords, so if uh, uh, one guy in the band is playing an alto-dominant and another is uh, playing an on alto dominant for instance, or other kinds of uh, situations where that happens. If you want to support my videos, then don't forget to like this video, and if you're not already a subscriber, then uh, please subscribe and stay up to date with all the videos and the lessons that I'm making. Uh, another way to help me is also to visit my uh, web store, because in that way then you're of course helping me get more time to make these videos. Uh, in the end of this q and I'm also going to ask you guys a question, because I'm thinking a little bit about changing the format of my lessons. Uh, and I think the people who are checking out my Q&As are really the people who are also really interacting and uh, sharing their opinions and, uh, make, and uh, leaving comments on the videos. So it's nice to hear what you guys think about this, but uh, I'll get back to that at the end of the video. So let's just get to the questions. Hi Jens, your Q&A vids are very interesting and enjoyable as are all your others. As I have no experience playing in a jazz combo, I wonder if you could enlighten me. When improvising, can problems arise with the guitarist's use of chord substitutions, for instance uh, tritone substitutions, resulting in clashing with the bass player? If so, how would you suggest to deal with this? Thank you, it's great to hear that you like the videos. Clashing is something that's happening all the time when, when we're improvising. It's actually also part of um, of the language of, of what is happening. When, once you start improvising and you start also changing the chords while you're playing then uh, clashing is, is part of the effect that you want. In a way it's also part of outside. You, you will actually find that there are some people who want it to clash so they don't like if um, if you as a comper are going to come along with them if when they start altering stuff or if they start looking for other chords and um, and also sometimes when you're trying to do that, then you're going to go in another direction than, than uh, the soloist. And, and that's also something where you kind of need to know who you're playing with uh, and be a little bit sort of uh, careful. It's, it's a judgment call every time. Um, but so, so if we look at this specific example you talked about, um, which is the tritone substitution, in that case, that specific case is not such a big problem. Uh, because if you have a 251 in G, so... A minus 7, D7, 2G. If you make a tritone substitution, then the guitar player would just be playing A flat 7 instead of D7. And then resolve that to G major. And if you look at what that would mean if the bass player is playing a D instead, then you're actually just gonna get this sound, which is a D7 altered. Because A flat 7 as a tritone substitute is usually considered a Lydian dominant. And actually that's the same scale as the D7 also scale. So in that case it's not really such a big issue. I think in general when you... Uh, there are two things here because if you're soloing then you are free to choose, I would say, that of course also um, a matter of uh, uh, taste and habit, but I would say as a soloist you're pretty free to mess with altering the dominance and, and uh, interpreting the chords in the way that you want and then as somebody comping a soloist, you have to be much more aware of what's happening with the soloist and try and follow him or her, because uh, that, that's the role you're having. Even though some soloists will like you to like that you suggest harmony, but I think in most cases you're just better off trying to keep it simple, and and uh, and also just to follow whatever they're doing. In uh, to what extent that you can. Sometimes it can be hard to hear because um, it's not always clear what's going on in whatever melody that they're, that they're hearing. They might be hearing a set of harmony that you don't hear because you don't have... They they actually have more information because they also hear stuff in, in their head while they're playing. Uh, so you can't always follow it and you have to guess and you have to interpret what's going on. And I think it's also the kind of thing where you can't be too conscious about it. You can, you can practice it and you can try and do it, but you have to do it on reflex because otherwise you're going to be too slow. 
so in that in that way it's just play along with the records and and, uh, and also just play a lot with other people that that's what's going to help with it um so 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 that's how I was think about clashing the other place where you get clashing really often is if you have to come together with a piano player uh because then you have two people trying to interpret the harmony and um I think it's a little known fact but but for a lot of people but actually in jazz we tend to interpret the harmony so it might say d7 and then we make it into a d7 altered and maybe we, maybe we don't and and what kind do we do at the mini scale do we do alto scale there are all these options and um and and if you have the two comping instruments they might choose to go either way <coughs> and then you pretty much have all 12 notes in, in the comping at the same time which sounds interesting and I think the the thing the way you work with this is just to have. Um, I think if you don't know the soloist, uh, just to stick with it. I think the whole situation with the piano player is is very complicated. Um, but if you if you're playing behind a soloist that you don't know, then keep it safe. You know. Um, um, so for my two five and G here, um, if you don't know if they're gonna alter the dominant, then just start with just playing the third and the seventh. Because they're going to be good anyway, and then you can always add or the like alterations or unaltered notes, depending on what you hear. Uh, and also, I think you'll find that soloists have habits, uh, because and probably you know that as a soloist yourself, you have certain ways that you deal with certain chords. Um, so uh, you try to also pick up on their habits if they're like. Uh, if they're really using melodic minor a lot, especially if they're using melodic minor, another place where you clash very often is on the tonic minor chords. So if a song is in minor and then um, there's a minor chord coming along, then uh, some people will play uh, Dorian and you'll get like, like just a, this kind of sound, or maybe even like pentatonic. And other more traditional uh, approach, another tr more traditional approach would be to play melodic minor in such a situation. And usually you will have the you you'll find that players tend to stick more to one thing than the other if they're playing a standard at least. I mean, if they're playing a minor blues, then they might do one thing in one chorus and another thing in the next. And you get used to picking up on it. Uh, and, and as a comper, you need to just be aware that if you're clashing, and you uh, and it's clearly not something that the the soloist wants. Then just stop playing. I mean, hands off. That's that works, you know. Uh, then at least you're not playing anything wrong. Uh, and and there's no there's no real need to to try and spell out the harmony that you're playing so that he clearly can follow you. It's his solo, so uh, then you're better off uh, actually not playing and, and and just leaving the space and then see if you can come back in again. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the thing with classing. I think it's something you, you shouldn't take too. Seriously, in the sense that if you if something clashes um, the first few times, then then you just you need to let it go right away when you're playing because focus on what's happening next in the music. Don't focus on that something clashes, unless of course every time in bar five of the second A things are clashing, then maybe talk about in the break like what are you guys playing there because it's not the same thing. You'll have those as well, but um, uh, but in general. I mean, we're playing jazz, we're improvising, uh, and and there are and you might not know the same changes to tunes and stuff if you're just jamming with other people, and also if you're doing gigs with other people, and then you can just ask between songs or I think if you're on a gig then ask in the break, you know, and talk talk to people about it. I also really really often ask the people that I'm playing with about certain things in terms of that they're using. Uh, if if I think they're using, for instance, the melodic minor stuff, they're oh, yeah, using melodic minor really a lot on that. And uh, usually you can also open that discussion up with a compliment because whatever they're doing, they're doing it really a lot, and usually it sounds pretty good then. So um, so then you just ask if that's what they're doing, or um, or if there's a place that you remember that something was clashing, then you just ask what what they think is there if they know. And of course, sometimes the answers can also be, "Yeah, I just don't know the tune in that bar." Uh, that uh, that happens because sometimes you have to play something you know, sometimes you play stuff a song that you don't know that well, and then there's going to be a gap somewhere. 
we are all human, and uh, it's not a disaster. It's one bar in Timbo, uh, 180 is not really a long time, even if it's every chorus. And then the best option is not to play. So that's a lot of small advice on this whole clashing thing, um, with the, the, the biggest part of it being don't take it too seriously and just listen to whoever you're playing with and, and try to figure out what happens. Thanks Jens, love these Q&A videos. I noticed that you have an X8 on your desk. Could you do a quick rundown on how it works in your setup and talk about how it fares versus a conventional amp, in particular for jazz? I had the original pod years ago and they seem to be getting a lot better with a number of affordable options available like Line 6, Fractal, etc. It's true that I, I use uh, this uh, X8 that's behind me, the Fractal Audio X8, and I've been using that. I got this one I got in uh, June. Uh, and before that I was using another one of their products, which is the older version, the, the, the XFX uh, Ultra. And there are a number of reasons why I like to work with, uh, with modeling. Um, I think one of the main practical reasons, well actually the practical reasons, there are also a few of those. Um, because ironically I actually use my, um, my modeling amp as a single channel uh, amplifier with, um, with some effect pedals in front of it. And um, that means that in terms of setup, I could just as easily have that. I could just have a tube amp and some pedals. Um, but the thing is that when I started using uh, effects more in my jazz playing, because my general uh, setup, you can actually check out my old video on my setup, which is with the Ultra, but the layout of my patch on, on the X8 is pretty much the same. Or maybe I'll see if I can add uh, a screenshot of it also um, from, from, uh, from the editing program from the X8. Uh, so my setup is really simple because basically what's happening is I have uh, uh, I have an amp and a cap simulated in uh, so so a speaker simulation and, and an amplifier simulation in in the X8. It's usually always a twin, sort of in the twin uh, because that's the that's the amp I, I like the most to play. I have a real Fender twin also, but it's very heavy and. Um, uh, and then I have an overdrive pedal uh, in front of that and um, on occasion I will use a tremolo as well and then I also use delay and reverb and and that's actually it and then I'm experimenting with other effects as well also a little bit but I'm, I'm not using anything on a regular basis uh, right now uh, but, um, but yeah I sometimes use a Leslie speaker simulator for instance I think there are some videos where I do that so, uh, so that's how it works. It's been, essentially, it's just a, a bunch of effects into an into an amplifier, and then um, the difference is that I often have to play really soft, and it's hard to get a tube amp, especially something like as big as a twin, to really work well if you have to play really soft. Uh, some of the concerts I do are on schools for relatively small children, and that means that I don't want to be way way loud and then it feels nice to just play through a modeler because then I can simulate that the amp is loud and when I'm done amplifying it the way I amplify my X8 uh, is, it's also in the video, the XFX uh, setup that I that I used before because it's the same so it's a, it's a power speaker, so a PA speaker and uh, that's because I'm just relying on everything in terms of feel and response from the um, from the amp to come out of the, the X8 and that and then the amp in the X8 can be really loud like turned up all the way and react like a tube amp that's turned up all the way which just plays nicer compresses in the right way uh, but in fact when I then um, what comes out of my speaker doesn't have to be that loud and of course there is some part of that which is about how we perceive stuff so it sounds a little bit different when you're playing soft and it sounds better if you play if you actually play loud um, but uh, but I think that's closer, and then it's also just easier to log around. I'll include a picture of the rig. It's like I, with this the setup I have now, and, and uh, that was the same before. I can take everything to the car in one go. It's just like small practical things that are really useful for me. Um, that I don't have to run back and forth because I need to load the stuff in the car like three or four times a week, and and then it's just easy to just have everything uh, in one go. So that's important. Another thing that's also proven to be important uh, later is that now that I started making all these YouTube videos, I can record myself really easily with the modeler. Uh, 
and with an amp that would also be uh, more complicated uh, because miking an amp up and getting a good sound is is, is quite difficult. So uh, so that's sort of the main reason why I use it. I think it works just as well, um, to be honest. Uh, I think it's been an improvement on my sound in concerts, mainly because when um, when sound engineers take an output from the XFX, then they really listen to how that sounds and they try to make something out of it. And I've had so many times before I started using this that people would mic up my uh, speaker and then then they would have some sort of uh, idea about what a guitar was supposed to sound like and usually it was so far away from how I think it should sound that it, it didn't didn't sound nice at all. Then, then like my sound would, like I, I wanted this and then in the PA you would probably get something like like this, you know, which is completely a different sound. So, so uh, because this whole idea of miking up and a speaker is it, it's a science. Ask any sound engineer. It's really something that you have to be good at and work on. And the people who do it live, um, at least the venues that I play, it's, they're very often not very good at it. And also, they're just. I mean, everything is, of course, like it's not the kind of thing where you're you're gonna sort of mess around with finding the sweet spot for, for the microphone. Um, so I was at the point where I was starting to think, well, maybe I should just bring my own microphone, my own microphone stands, and then always just have that and give that to the sound engineer to get a good sound. Because I was just tired of sounding like John, Fr John Frusciante and Red Hot Chili Peppers whenever I wanted to play jazz in a, in, on, a, on a bigger venue. Uh, but actually this, this, this way of working with it, because they're a little bit, they're not so familiar with it, then they are starting by just listening and that's just gonna help and I've had a lot of sound guys also saying that they really like it because it's easy to work with and then probably the ones that didn't like it were too uh, polite to tell me I don't know but uh, of course it's with gear it's like this that it's not for everybody so so uh, I like the XFX because I uh, and, and their stuff because I don't mind sitting down and messing with it uh, another thing that I like about it is also that I I experiment with effects and instead of buying a million different pedals and trying that out, I can just put one in there and try and see if I can do something with it and, and experiment with it. And, uh, and it's very, within the XFX, it's a little bit complicated to program, but it's also very, very versatile. So you can do a lot of different things if you really check it out. Um, and, and again, that's the kind of aspect where it's like, that's for, for some people and not for other people, uh, whether it's right for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so the, the thing with, with, for me with modeling, whether it's for you or not, is also a little bit like, what, what do you want, you know? If you're really, uh, because the point of my setup is that it w will work with pretty much any gig that I do. So both if it's like a, a pop gig or a soul gig or a musical, uh, or if I'm recording at home, making a jazz record with uh, Trabin or playing standards, uh, uh, or playing a, a, a Jazz for Kids uh, concert at a school. It has to work in all those places, and that's really easy. If you have one thing that does everything, then that's that's just so practical for, for what I do. Uh, and that would be very difficult to, to sort of pull off with a traditional setup, I think. And then especially on top of that, you have this, this idea that I can just experiment with it without buying pedals for hundreds of euros, uh, because I know in fact, know very little about it, but the different effects and how they work uh, in terms of what pedal does what. But I have some. <clears throat> I've, I've managed to build up some knowledge on on how to program them and really understand how they work, and then that helps me keep on developing my own sound uh, and changing it and, and making it uh, better for certain things that suits my playing or my taste at, at this point in time. And also, I can sort of get it to fit to my 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 taste without having to buy new stuff all the time. So for that, I think it's 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 worthwhile for me. And then if you, uh, I think the biggest problem people have is is that they want they want the um, the modeler to work as a normal guitar amplifier. But the thing is that actually guitar amplifiers also have some disadvantages, especially like. When we're talking about something like a Fender Twin, 
which has this open back cabinet where a lot of low end is, is a lot of low frequencies coming out. And I play with double bass players, and they tend to they get drowned out in, in low end stuff. Everything gets muddy really fast. So for me, it's actually useful that I can make it a little bit less um, like a real amp by cutting away some of those lows, and then leave that frequency error free for the bass player, so that on stage everybody hears the bass a lot better. Uh, it's a sort of a side effect, but but uh, it's something that I actually got from. I've had that feedback from two bass players now that they're really talking about how that makes a huge difference for them. That I don't take up that frequency area at all. That I can just cut up off everything under I don't know 120 hertz or something, uh, so that that they have more definition in that area. Uh, and and that's for everybody. But and anyway, it's also not the kind of thing. It doesn't it doesn't really add anything to the experience for the audience. It's only about how you feel about it. And if you still want to have that with a model that's as good as, as this, probably the, the new Line 6 is also this good, then you can also use it with a power amp and a real guitar cabinet and then you'll still have that. Um, which is something I'm tempted to try out once in a while also, just, just to have that, that kind of vibe, because I do play on, in some places I do play on, on, uh, on real amps. Um, Especially if I'm I'm flying somewhere where I can't bring my my uh, my gear, or if uh, and also where I'm teaching at the conservatory, I'm playing on a real amp. So and and there is a slight difference, <clears throat> but I think actually I think the the like ninety percent of that is is that low frequency thump that I'm that I actually take out of the sound here. Uh, so yeah, so so that's sort of my my thoughts on on whether you can use modeling. I th I think the, the that it works really well. Um, but it is the kind of thing where you have to sit down and get it to work for you and maybe you're not in a kind of person that tells you that, that finds that inspiring um, or that doesn't want that, don't, doesn't want to spend the time on it and then you're maybe better off using something else. Um, for, for jazz in general there was another question because there are two questions that I'm trying to answer now. Um, I think for jazz I prefer tube amps for sure. I think it sounds better and I think the of course, the modeler I think sounds like a true amp, um, but I also have a polytone amp, and that sounds good too. It's, it's very different, so there are certain things that it doesn't do. I think with the music we play with Trabin right now, it wouldn't do that that well. Uh, it's too dark, and it's also not that well suited for for overdrive. But for the rest, you can use that. It depends on what kind of jazz you play and what kind of sound you have. Um, so because. My basic sound, what you guys are hearing on the videos, is always going to be like a twin that's turned pretty much all the way up with an overdrive in front of it. And that's out of the question that I would uh, I would do that in real life. That's so loud that there's no stage that I can do this. Um, so, uh, so that's the advantage of using uh, this type of setup for me. So yeah, I don't know what you guys use. I mean, if you got, if you have things that you want to ask me about this, then leave a comment. Or if you have uh, own experiences or um, strong ideas, then uh, that discussion is always uh, interesting or fun. Uh, because of course modeling is a touchy subject. Uh, the next thing we'll do is tone wood, that's, that's just as good. So, uh, but yeah, that's how, uh, how I use it. What would happen if you used a thin pick? Would you be able to play the same fast lines? So I don't use a thin pick, as you can probably tell from the question. and. Um, the one I'm using is this one, this is a John Doe uh, custom pick, uh, they're, um, uh, that's a Russian company and um, uh, they, we developed it uh, together, sort of, we're developing it, I mean they, they sent me some stuff and we sent a few uh, times back and forth. Uh, actually Igor from uh, John Doe sent me um, a code for, uh, um, for a discount, so I'll put that in the link description, if you want to try these out, then uh, send him an email, uh, and you can first just use the code to order with in uh, in his store. Um, so, so yeah, so the ones I'm using here. So I think the the stuff that I'm looking for in a pick is that it does not have too much attack, and I think that the thing with the thickness, um, I'm not sure how important that is really. I think it's mostly a sound thing about how how the pick sounds. So just to demonstrate that, um, uh, I have this. This is actually not a really thin pick. This is a medium because I don't have any really 
thin ones. I'll, I'll make a picture of it and post it also. It's this one I got when, uh, so I've had this for three, four years almost. Uh, which I got this from Steve's music store in Ottawa from when we played there we, at the Ottawa Jazz Festival and we got some free picks and I don't use these so I still have it um, and if I play a line with uh, with my normal pick then that sounds like this and if I play the same thing with uh, with this one which is medium so not I think that's quite a huge Difference. I can play with it. Um, there is. I. I don't really like how it feels because the the thing I use with with when I play um, my lines, I guess I'm relying on the pick not moving. Uh, so I might not grip it really fast, or really sort of tightly. I'm not sure actually because I, I never. I don't think too much about it to be honest, but but it's not really not moving that much in my fingers. But but it's also not. I'm not really like. Uh, clamping down on it um, because it has to be loose and has to be you have to be able to move fast and, and I'm also moving my fingers just a little bit when I pick I think so <clears throat> the difference is sound you can hear it I, th I think you can hear it in the video also that there's a huge difference sound and mostly the difference is that this is just much much warmer than than this and there's a lot more a lot more attack which is uh, what what I was after when, when I was uh, talking to uh, to the the guys from John Doe that I wanted to pick that I play a little bit hard so I get attack um, I mean I don't grip really hard but I do play kind of hard I really hit the strings and I, I get a lot of attack really easily and that's the one thing that I don't like about well about my own sound I'm also changing it a little bit but but also about some picks they will have really a lot of attack and then that that sound is not that nice um, so I I try to take that out. Uh, and, and these John Doe picks work really well for that. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll add some uh, photos of the, of the picks so you can get or an idea about what it is. And then, um, of course, yeah, check out uh, John Doe. Uh, I'm really happy with, with these. Uh, they're unlike anything that I've actually ever tried in terms of sound. I think they, they sound way better than, than anything else I have. Not that I've tried a million things. Uh, but they really do sort of hit the spot on, on not having too much attack uh, and, and also having a really warm sound which it's really even if I'm not playing hard like it's really a different EQ curve with this pick uh, and, and I think that's what sort of the main reason for, for, for using whatever pick you use and then you just have to try a few um, so uh, yeah but you can give like the John Doe ones are not that expensive um, so so uh, Give them a try. Uh, their shop is PayPal, so it should be safe to order uh, via PayPal. Even uh, if, because I've, I've heard from a lot of people when I started talking about these that they're like, "Well, it's in in uh, in uh, Belarus, and we don't feel safe using credit cards there and stuff." Which, to some degree, I understand. But you can actually pay with PayPal, and PayPal is fairly safe, to the best of my knowledge. Otherwise, then PayPal is not safe anywhere. But uh, yeah. Um, and otherwise send Igor an email uh, I'm sure he'll help you so uh, he's, he's a very easy guy to work with yeah so that's why I'm using the picks that I'm using I'd like to hear your take on bebop scales David Baker seems to be almost religious about using this scale on 8 note rhythms with chord tones landing in strong beats while players such as Matt Warnock are more about using bebop scales regardless of rhythms and strong beats using more of their ears I never really think in terms of bebop scales or use bebop scales. Um, I remember when I just started playing jazz, I got a book about playing jazz. I think it was one of the David Baker books, and it did have all those exercises in it. So, um, yeah. So to sum that up, what I got from it was was that it, that you um, would take the scale, you would add a chromatic lead note somewhere in the scale to have the the chord tones on the store on the beats essentially. So if you have a C7, I think that's probably the example he used. Then um, let's do that here. So C7. Uh, so that's just C7 scale or F major scale, where C7 is found. And then uh, you add a leading note between the the flat seven and the root to have. chord tones uh, 
that's the C7 arpeggio. Uh, so yeah, so so you get that on the on the beat. Um, and yeah, so the only thing I actually remember is like it was something like this, and I read it. Uh, and my issue with that was that I don't see any reason to practice making melodies that are like this. And, uh, I mean, in terms of playing, who wants to listen to a solo that's, that's only going to be scale stuff? That, that, that makes no sense to me at all. Um, and I already had that at that time, so I just read it and thought, well, I, I'm not going to play anything that I think sounds nice with this. Uh, or I have to think so much about what I'm doing on a very sort of strict, methodical, systematical way that that's not how I play music at all. And that's the reason why I never really got into it. And I just never checked out Europe scales at all. I find that, of course, if, you, if it appeals to you, if you listen to the scale and you think, well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the thing is that if you make, if you can, are constructing this scale and you're looking at some Parker solos, then... <laughs> Then it is it is in there, right? These kind of lines, he does use that, and and those are using that exact uh, chromatic leading notes. But I doubt if he actually thought about it as a scale. I mean, I don't know, uh, but I, I doubt it. And I think I think you should just think of it as leading notes. I think that's a much better approach um, because that's how you're using it melodically. So, and there might be places where you're you like using leading notes. You can make some nice stuff with it, but I don't really see any real reason to practice it as a skill, um, unless, of course, I mean, if yeah, the, it's kind of it, it's going to be one of those things where if you hear it and you think, well, that sounds really cool, I want to work on this, then work on it and see what you can use it for. Uh, I can only speak for myself in this and, and say that I thought it was weird to make it into a system. Uh, I know people who've done stuff with it. Uh, mostly, when I hear stuff coming out of this, people trying to demonstrate it, I'm, I, I find it everything but impressive. Because it's like all these scale melodies that I find boring to listen to. Um, but that's also because you're only going to be playing scale melodies if you're using this, and then, then that's not, that's just not how we play. Yes, there's also never one part of those. So, yeah. Um, so I don't really have a take on it. I think, uh, and I didn't check out what, what, what Matt has on his side for, for this. Um, but I would imagine if he's more free about it, I think you should treat it as a scale. We're not practicing scales and then just trying to play melodies with with the scales uh, stepwise. Nobody does that. Actually, we spend a huge amount of time getting away from that. So um, I think I think you're better off just trying to do that and, and just go by feel. And if you have to build a system for it, you're thinking way too much. You're not developing uh, your sense of melody and your sense of... Uh, on your ear and you're playing because you're too worried about some sort of fairly random system. Also because as soon as you can play a C7 arpeggio you might want to actually emphasize one of the extensions and then uh, that's going to get more difficult maybe. So so for that I would say don't don't spend too much time on it uh, like that and, and maybe there are other things that you're better off developing. Uh, and if you do want to check it out, probably if you want to check it out then maybe there's like a Gugansi book on this. and. Uh, he's. I have one of his other books, um, and he's very systematical in his approach. But uh, uh, at least he really checks it out, and and he can really play. So that might be worthwhile checking out. And if you have to check out your skills, but yeah, I never, I never uh, looked at it actually. Uh, I no, I I I, I played along with the. With the backing track from of the CD with all the backing tracks because he has a really good band uh, doing the backing tracks. But uh, for the rest, I, I never really really checked out uh, that stuff from from that. So so I can't say much more about it. I would say anything you do with music, if it does not inspire you, watch out. Uh, I mean, there's there's like a point where it's like okay, I need to know the notes and I need to know the different scales and the different arpeggios. Okay, but uh, you do not need to know a system. If the system does not really appeal to you, then maybe find something that does appeal to you and then practice working on that while you're trying to actually make music. Uh, it's very important that we don't practice stuff that is um, just some sort of system because we've heard that it's right. Uh, I think it's more important that we also just experiment and try to develop our ears 
and uh, like I've talked about several times also our sense of of melody and our ability to write melodies and, and, and sort of really think about that um, that can be really really more, much more useful uh, and then the way you do that I think is, is much more about sort of reflecting on your own playing uh, and maybe analyzing bits and pieces of other people's playing that you think is nice I think that's the way to go about that uh, and that's that I would suggest is the time better spent than be your skills unless again that you you think that it's really inspiring what you hear people use it for, then uh, then go for it. I mean, you can definitely make good stuff with it. That's not the problem. Just don't get lost in a system for a system's sake. That that's that's the tricky thing. So there were some answers to some of the questions that I got from you guys on uh, the last video and uh, via uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, don't forget that if you have a question, then. Uh, send me a message on uh, Facebook or uh, leave a comment on this video and then hopefully I can get to it later uh, it's uh, as usual I think it is really fun to do all these things and uh, to talk about all these things it's nice also because I can go into depth in a very loose way about it so I don't really think about how long it's gonna be I'm just gonna talk about it and uh, uh, you can always skip to the next topic if it doesn't interest you I'm, I'm always have I always have the list of contents in, in this video uh, if you want to support my videos in general, then of course like this video, subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed, uh, and you can of course also help me by checking out my web store uh, and uh, help me get some more time to make the videos. Uh, then for the question that I talked about, so I've been sort of thinking about changing the, the way I do the normal lessons a bit, uh, mostly because I've been doing these lessons for almost two and a half years now, uh, and I'm using pretty much the same format all the time um, and that's fine but I also feel like it could be nicer to just uh, maybe find like the, the way I've done it until now has been very uh, thorough and very uh, sort of trying to cover a whole topic and that means that checking out a lesson is actually a lot of work because it's, it's stuff that I know I also worked on for a series of weeks or months to check out you know that, that's kind of how I arrive at it and then I, I take, make a lesson on it because I think it's important to check out, or at least it's, it's an interesting resource in some way. Uh, not all of the lessons are like this, but, but it's, that's very much the case. And um, I've covered a lot of the stuff already, and some of the, I've also made some lessons twice just because I'm getting better at making videos and I have a better camera and, and stuff like that. Um, but I also was thinking about doing something that's a little bit more practical um, because. I can also tell, like, now I'm asking you guys, and you are probably the guys who are playing, mostly playing actually jazz standards and stuff, but there are also a lot of people who are watching these videos who don't really get into playing actual standards and songs, they're playing more modal things and more backing tracks and stuff like that. Uh, and I think maybe I could make something that works a little better for them as well, if I'm a little bit more specific uh, and not taking such a huge, huge topic uh, all the time. So I'm going to be experimenting with that. Uh, a bit in the coming videos when I sort of try to figure it out. I'm also just changing things because I want to keep it interesting for myself. I just want to you know, do stuff that's not the same all the time because then I get bored and uh, then I'm not going to make good videos, I think. Uh, because while I say that you guys have to support my channel, that's of course true. It's also about me doing this because I think it's fun to do. That That is how it's... otherwise I wouldn't do it at all. So, um, so I'm just experimenting with that. And any sort of input, I know the people who are watching, even if you watch this far in a Q&A video, then probably you have an opinion, you've seen more of my videos, uh, so any sort of feedback on this is of course interesting for me. I'll be asking on social media, I think, as well. Um, so what I want to know from you guys is, like, would you be interested in sort of smaller lessons that are a little bit more, um, just sort of one specific example of something and then trying to, to, to sort of uh, not taking a whole topic of quarter harmony or something, but but more just keeping it very um, uh, much more compact and, and have one example, and then you can move it around in other courts yourself and stuff like that. I think that's sort of the thing I'm leaning towards right now. And I'll just try it a few times, and then we'll see what you guys like also. But but I would like to know if you have ideas like that, because I think the more I don't want to make longer lessons than what I'm doing already now. That's 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 for sure, that I don't have time. And also the, they will go in the in, in my web store, I think. 
because there is so much work for you. So this is another way of making a video um, where where it's very practical, it's easy to apply, uh, and it's just going to be sort of a little bit more of a single to topic, uh, a smaller thing, and then uh, one lick or two or three licks as examples of something, and then that's it. So that's that's all the thing I'm thinking about doing right now, um, and yeah, let me know what you think. If you think that's a good idea, if you have examples of like lessons that you think I should make stuff more like this or more like that, then uh, let me know. Um, probably those. If you're gonna send me links, you probably have to send them to me on Facebook or email or something like this because YouTube immediately makes links into spam uh, on my channel anyway. So. Um, yeah, so, so, so that's, uh, that's my question, really. Uh, uh, so what, what do you guys play over? Do you play more standards? Are you playing more of uh, modal tracks? And also, what do you think about the format of, of making another format of lessons? I mean, I'll be doing the other lessons as well still, and because I, some of them I like to do, and, and some of them I still have ideas for. But, uh, uh, but I also just want to try something new, so, so that all of us don't get bored with uh, what I'm doing. So yeah, thank you for watching, and uh, I hope you have something to say about uh, the format thing, because feedback is, is really useful for me on that. And then um, I'll have a new lesson ready on uh, Wednesday, uh, not on Wednesday, on Thursday, because it's always on Thursday. And uh, that's about it. See you Thursday.